oh, I'm in a lab coat. Things are getting serious. Do I look like a doctor? I mean, I am a doctor, but I'm not that kind of doctor. Don't think I could save your life. <laughs> if they yelled out, is there a doctor on this plane? I would be like, no. No, there is not. Ah! When I was about 18, I had my wisdom teeth out. Hi guys, Future Joe here. Just before this Joe keeps talking, I thought I'd point out a few things. First of all, this episode contains descriptions of the use of recreational drugs and pre-anesthesia surgery. If you don't want to listen to either of those two things, I would go and watch another episode. <laughs> also, in summary, drugs bad, don't do it. Okay, bye. <laughs> When I was about 18, I had my wisdom teeth out, all four of them taken out at once. I went into the hospital, they put me under general anaesthetic, yanked the teeth out, I woke up, I vomited a few times because I have a really bad reaction to general anaesthesia, and then they sent me home. Really the only form of trauma I experienced was having to look like a chipmunk for a few days. Surgery for us is easy, I mean it's scary, but it's easy. We don't remember it. I mean, the surgery for me is like a black spot in my memory. There's nothing there. But unfortunately, that was not always the case. Pre-anesthesia, surgery was, um, <clears throat> well, <laughs> have you ever seen Game of Thrones? Actually, pain during surgery was considered sort of a good thing. According to medical professionals back then, losing consciousness was actually a really bad thing. Things like opiates and alcohols were used really sparingly. Surgeons would actually try things like distracting patients with things like stinging nettles. I feel like if I were getting my foot amputated and somebody came up to me and went eh, with a stinging nettle, I'd be like, dude, what are you doing? In 1811, Fanny Burney, an English novelist and playwright, needed a mastectomy. You know, the one where you have to get your breast cut off. Her surgeons, to help her with the anxiety, picked a random day and only gave her two hours notice that the surgery was going to take place. I feel like from her description of the event, two hours notice was too much. Brace yourselves, this is harrowing. I mounted, therefore, unbidden, the bedstead, and Monsieur Dubois placed me upon the mattress and spread a cambric handkerchief upon my face. It was transparent, however, and I saw through it that the bedstead was instantly surrounded by the seven men and my nurse. I refused to be held. But when, bright through the cambric, I saw the glitter of polished steel, I closed my eyes. I would not trust to convulsive fear the sight of the terrible incision. Yet, when the dreadful steel was plunged into the breast, cutting through veins, arteries, flesh, nerves, I needed no injunctions not to restrain my cries. I began a screen that lasted unintermittingly during the whole time of the incision and I almost marvel that it rings not in my ears still. So excruciating was the agony. So around about this time in the 1800s, there was a new party drug in play. It had first been synthesized about 300 years earlier by mixing alcohol and sulfuric acid. It was called diethyl ether. I'm just going to refer to it from now on as ether. It's a little bit easier. It's not so much of a mouthful, diethyl ether. Bleh. Around about the 1800s, ether was used along with nitrous oxide and things like helium as a recreational drug. They were called ether frolics. People would come along, they'd sit in an audience, and then people up on the stage would inhale these gases and then do ridiculous things. Now, in Georgia, in the United States, there was a medical doctor named Crawford Long. The story was that he used to go to these ether frolics all the time. In fact, he used to synthesize a drug for his students and they would all kind of sit around the fire and inhale it together. After a while, he started to notice something that nobody had really figured out before. You see, after the effects of the drug wore off, they would come to with bruises and cuts and scrapes all over them from where they'd been flailing into lamps and furniture. I love lamp. They didn't remember feeling the pain, they didn't remember any of it. So he thought, maybe I could use this as an anaesthetic. Maybe I could use this during surgery to make it less traumatic for my patients and probably for myself. So Crawford decided to use it as an anaesthetic and he had the perfect patient in mind, a Mr. James Venable. Venable unfortunately had some tumours in his neck that really needed to come out. Later on, when Crawford published his findings, he said that, Mr. Venable consulted me on several occasions with regard to the propriety of removing two small tumours situated on the back part of his neck. But postponed from time to time having the operations performed from dread of pain. Pain is not something that we enjoy experiencing by any means and most doctors hated inflicting it on their patients. So Crawford convinced Venable to try ether after explaining to him his experiences. It probably helped that Venable had also been a frequent party goer at these ether frolics and had experienced this phenomenon himself. So Venable came in and Crawford gave him ether and performed the surgery and Venable didn't react. There was no signs of him being in pain, there was no signs of him being conscious at all. When Venable came to, Crawford actually had to physically show him the tumours that he removed from the back of his neck before he would actually believe that he'd been in surgery in the first place. Because this was revolutionary. 
The pain of surgery up until this point was, quite frankly, torture. Many people ended up being scarred psychologically if they didn't die on the table. And now it's easier. I mean, surgery's still scary. I was terrified when I went in to have my wisdom teeth taken out, and that was a relatively straightforward procedure. But at least we don't have to worry about feeling pain so great it may actually kill us. I call that a win. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching everyone. Remember that you can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter. You can make suggestions about who I should cover next. And you can also ask me as many questions as you want. While the purification of ether, even in Morton's time, was fairly well understood by research chemists, in all probability, the ether used by Morton and others for anesthetic purposes was made by the primitive method of the United States Pharmacopeia of 1840. Following these directions, the apothecary of the day poured into a tubulated retort a certain amount of alcohol and added, in small portions, a similar weight of strong sulfuric acid. This was boiled and the vapor condensed in a cool receiver. More alcohol was added during the course of the distillation. The resulting distillate contained, along with the ether, both alcohol and water.